Hi, my name is Professor Igor Rudan and I will show you today how do we use the paths tool, how do we implement the paths tool. You have seen that quite seemingly complicated conceptual uh, framework in my last presentation, uh, but it all becomes quite uh, more simple when you start using this tool. The tool is simply an Excel sheet and everything that I was showing you in those many slides is actually now here in this one Excel sheet and I'll take you through it. So you see all those uh, different uh, branches of the trees are now shown in this one slide and we are now down to secondary healthcare, remember? And then moving uh, up to the what happens from the primary healthcare um, and you see that some of them are being referred. You see here what's happening at seeking treatment at the community health worker level and then at seeking uh, treatment at home or actually self-treating at home. You can see that the clinical algorithm is important everywhere. That's this uh, table, the yes and no. And this is the top of the uh, top of the Excel sheet and we will now zoom in to see what it tells us. Okay, so this is what it tells us. <clears throat> it tells us th many things that you would not be able to intuitively understand. So these are the parameters, all the parameters that you will need to construct your path tool in any given environment anywhere in low and middle income countries for any disease. You will need the number of uh, people uh, who could be at risk of getting a disease or dying and then uh, the proportion which seems to have contracted the disease, proportion who seek care, proportion who really developed the disease, case fatality rate if they were not treated and then proportion of those who seek care and receive self-treatment, proportion of those who seek care and receive community health workers treatment, proportion of those who seek care in primary and then secondary uh, health care, effectiveness of self-treatment at home, effectiveness of community health workers treatment, effectiveness of primary health care treatment, effectiveness of secondary health care treatment. Then you need a sensitivity of home-based diagnosis and specificity of home-based diagnosis, but also for community health workers diagnosis, for primary health care worker or physician's diagnosis and for secondary health care diagnosis. And finally, you need a proportion of parents who comply with treatment if this is an issue, or this could be patients who comply with treatment, and proportion of patients who comply with referral from primary to secondary health care. So those are 23 <coughs> parameters that you need to have for any context and any disease if you want to understand the so-called like uh, health systems autopsy of all deaths. So health systems autopsy is kind of a social autopsy, but um, it's really from the perspective of health system, it is letting you understand how are you failing certain uh, patients and the people who need health system and treatment and where are you failing them and what could you potentially change within this health system so to save many of these uh, people. And let us play with it a little bit because here is <coughs> what we now believe to be true for an example of newborn global deaths in 2001, uh, 2011. So <coughs> of about 907,000 uh, deaths, uh, we, uh, we assumed uh, from the PAFS, uh, meth uh, PAFS tool <coughs> that about 352 uh, died because they did not seek care and did not receive any treatment. So um, uh, over a third and then uh, that some died although they did seek care but self-treated and did not respond. Some died although they sought care but community health workers treated and they did not respond. Some died although they sought care at primary health care facility but a doctor there missed diagnosis and didn't treat. Uh, some died although they sought care and um, primary health care doctor intended to treat but parents didn't comply. Some died although they sought care and uh, primary health doctor treated but parents couldn't go to the secondary health care. Some died although they sought care at secondary health care but the doctor missed the diagnosis and some died although they did seek care at the secondary health care treatment and the doctors there tried everything but simply the child did not respond. So these are the deaths that we will, um, it will be very very difficult 
uh, to um, get to zero this 136,000. But actually everything before that, uh, there is <coughs> a hope of uh, reducing those debts. So clearly there is still a, t a lot of uh, opportunity for reduction. Now let's see what happens when we move some of these parameters and change them. So the number stays the same. Uh, proportion of symptoms uh, stays uh, the same. Now if we could change care seeking from 69% to say 85%, let's see what happens. See, immediately you understand where you are saving lives. So you're saving lives everywhere in all of these. The only, uh, uh, so you're, you're, and you're, um, uh, you're saving 53,000 lives globally. Uh, you see that the number dropped from uh, 907,000 to 853,000 in the cell AU12. Okay, so uh, you see, and you see where these actually uh, come from, okay, and how this happened. Okay, now let's go back. and try to do something else. All right, what if case fatality rate of untreated sepsis could be changed? But so this is something that, well, untreated sepsis, that's a, that's a property of disease. So, so we, we can't really, so let, that's not really what we're after here. We are here perhaps to change the, uh, say, proportion of those who seek care in secondary health care rather than self-treat. Okay, so let's say that we increase uh, this by 10% and we decrease this by 10%. You see what happens now? Um, if rather than, um, if, if we could shift those who self-treated at home, if we could shift 10% of the total with symptoms from self-treatment at home to actually um, to, to uh, immediately going to secondary health care, we could save 37,000 uh, lives. But you see how? I mean, these things are not um, intuitive at all. So, so let us see how did this uh, save lives. Basically, here you had a number that was uh, bigger than 100,000, but now 74,000 of these deaths were saved because they were shifted from home care to directly to secondary health care. But what happened at the secondary health care is that we now have a worsened situation. We have more deaths uh, in, uh, because the doctor missed diagnosis and did not treat and because the doctor treated but did not respond. But more pa patients now came to secondary health care and this is why we have more deaths here. But the net effect, as you can tell, is 37,000 child deaths saved. So you can see how counterintuitive this is and how actually complicated, but it becomes simple when you see it here. So let us go back again and try something else. Let us say if we could increase effectiveness of self-treatment at home by somehow providing everyone some magic pill, and if it could be 90%, let's see what would happen. Suddenly, we would save 50,000 uh, uh, lives immediately, but only uh, in that row self-treatment at home, right? Going back, what if we could uh, improve effectiveness of primary health care treatment, which at the moment stands at 35%. What if we could raise it to almost 90% by some splendid uh, intervention at this level? You see, that could uh, lead to 40,000 deaths reduction. And uh, that's probably unrealistic, but uh, yet still only reduces uh, 40,000 out of 900 thousand deaths, uh, even that th these figures are global. What if we could uh, improve effectiveness at the secondary health care to 100? 
you could save 136, you could save everyone who comes to secondary health care. So that globally, in global terms, in, is reduction from 907,000 to 770,000, so that's still a limited potential. But what would be great is if this would possi be possible, simply because then if we could build enough hospitals and get every child to the hospital, we would no longer have any deaths of sepsis. But this is beginning to show you how unrealistic <laughs> many of these scenarios are and just how far we are from getting completely rid of these problems. Okay? And just how much do we need universal health care and how much do we need uh, excellent uh, and quick di rapid diagnostics and uh, reliable diagnostics and good treatments, okay? Um, good. What if we could, for example, <coughs> improve sensitivity of home-based diagnosis to 100 and specificity? Or just let's start with the sensitivity. With the sensitivity, we would save some lives. The effectiveness of treatment there is not terribly great, but we would save some lives. But now check this. What if we also move specificity up? Remember, 6281, all right? You see, nothing happens. If you change specificity, nothing happens. But let's move this back. Let's move sensitivity back. And you see, specificity simply is not important at the home care level. So let's put it back. We could put any number here. It's not going to help. What about community health worker? Let's put this to 100%. We save 7,000 lives, right? Let's put it back. Let's now change specificity to 1. Nothing happened, all right? Nothing. You see, you would not know these things unless you have this kind of uh, tool to help you understand. Then what would happen if primary healthcare worker um, or a doctor had a perfect sensitivity of his assessment? Oops! There are all sorts of things happen, all right? And you save 35,000 lives. So this is telling you there is a potential there. There is a potential if you could improve sensitivity of primary healthcare workers' diagnosis from 70% to 100%. Look, there is quite a decent potential to change things. And let's get it back where it was. What happens at specificity at this level? Absolutely nothing, all right? So it's just not useful. Sensitivity is important. And then again, you have secondary healthcare level, sensitivity, specificity. Let's put specificity first to 100 just to see whether it matters here, no. So it just doesn't matter anywhere, really. And we don't need this parameter at all. So we need to really be focused entirely on sensitivity. What happens at secondary health care if you have 100%? Look, it is really important. It still has quite a decent capacity. And it does save 21,000 uh, lives, even just the change from 90 to 100. So that means that sensitivity at the secondary health care level is a really, really important thing. Because you're capturing all sepsis and you're providing them uh, treatment, you really don't want to miss sepsis case. You really want to be as sensitive as possible at this level. So uh, you see, those are things that... Uh, are useful to know, but you would not think about them. Now, what happens if a uh, proportion of parents who comply with antibiotics at the primary healthcare level moves to 100% uh, from 90%? 9,000 deaths saved, all right? So there is a lot. Uh, so you see how important it is to uh, ensure compliance. That you would not think that that would matter much from 90 to 100%, but it does matter. And what about proportion of parents who comply with primary health care referral to secondary health care if it goes from 60% uh, to 100%? 12,000 deaths saved. Again, quite a decent uh, life-saving uh, potential. So I hope I can, I, I've shown you just how helpful this is, even if these parameters here that we use them are completely wrong and uh, uh, I mean they're still kind of internally consistent and they still add up to the right uh, correct number of deaths. So if one is a bit higher the other is then a bit lower but they're not going to be terribly 
uh, off uh, and they are based on quite a lot of evidence that we did manage to gather and some expert opinion as well. So they may be wrong but they're not terribly wrong but what helps here really is whether they're wrong or not it really helps you to understand what and where lies the potential uh, and also the limitations to reduction of new, new, newborn survival. Now let's do the ultimate experiment. Let's try to be as good as we possibly can in everything. So what would happen if proportion of those who seek care in primary health care, what would happen if everyone goes to hospital, straight to hospital? What would happen then? Everyone goes to hospital. Ooh, we are dividing by zero here in, in some of these. Oh, we, we shouldn't have zero. Maybe we should have, we should leave one percent because one thing leads to another. So, okay. So, yeah, these, these things are somewhere in a denominator. And maybe it's good that I made this mistake because others would wonder what's happening. So let's say 97% uh, of them end up in the hospital. Let's see what would happen. See, this is really striking. Mm -hmm. If everyone went straight to hospital, <laughs> you would save 169,000. You would think that you would save more. Mm -hmm. So where is the problem? The problem is with, is with care seeking, okay? Now, what if care seeking went to 95%? Ooh, now you're saving 320. What if care seeking went to 100? Now you're saving 350,000, but you're still left with 557,000 deaths. How come? Uh, so basically, you are having everyone seeking care, and you are having 97 people going to a hospital. Why are you still having 557,000 deaths? Well, let's read. Died, although sought care, but self-treated did not respond, that's 10,000, so those are those 1%. But where are they dying? Died, although sought care uh, at secondary health care, but secondary health care doctor missed diagnosis and didn't treat. And finally, died, although sought care at secondary health care and doctor treated, but did not respond. This is where they are dying. They did not respond. They simply did not respond and we simply can't do much. But why is this? This is because the effectiveness of secondary healthcare treatment is standing at 58 percent. Okay? So what if we increased that to 90 percent? Now we're talking, okay? Now we're talking. Now we are having the deaths of sepsis reduced to 237,000. But still they're dying. So what else could we do? We could increase sensitivity of secondary healthcare diagnosis, right? To absolute perfection. What happens? Ooh, we're down to 138, okay? So, and uh, compliance I think here should no longer matter, but let's just see. No, it doesn't matter. So this is what could potentially be achieved over time. To go from 907 to 136, what would we need? We would need, firstly, we would need everyone uh, to uh, seek care, right? Everyone to seek care, that's this number one. We would also need those who seek care, 97 percent of them, to immediately go straight to hospital. We would need the effectiveness of hospital-based treatment to be 90% and we would need the doctors at the secondary health care level to have a s sensitivity of 100% and then you would remove 770,000 deaths and you would still be left with 136,000 deaths because simply some did not uh, respond. So do you understand now this a lot better? I think this is remarkably useful to explain to you where are the limits to what you can achieve and the limits to impact and how and why kids um, uh, die 
from newborn sepsis from the perspective of health systems. So, so, so PATHS is really a uh, health systems level orthopsy of, um, uh, of, of deaths in low and middle income countries. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.